Birmingham, etc. But I do want to highlight some of the things that you might not know about the movement that I think are really worthwhile remembering. No more worthwhile than remembering the contributions and sacrifices that the individuals who participated in the movement uh, did. But the, the movement itself, to me, is particularly profound because it asks us as American citizens to confront our past, to look at who we are, what we've become, and to reconcile that with what we believe. And what we found in the civil rights movement was we were extraordinarily uncomfortable, at least the white population was, with who we are, what we have made of this society. We, in many ways, were like the founding fathers who struggled with the notion of freedom and opportunity for all, liberty for all, and at the same time, turned our, black, our backs on black Americans and said, well, the appropriate venue for you is slavery and segregation. Thomas Jefferson wrestled with that all his life and never resolved it. But John Adams, George Washington, Ben Franklin, they realized the dilemma that America faced and that the only way it could really come to terms with what it stood for was to go back in time and rectify this incredible injustice. Well, we never did. It took us the better part of 200 years and the leadership of some of the people we have had introduced to us today to be aware of the mistakes we had made. So where did St. Augustine fit into this story, this extraordinary story, the one that David Norton mentioned, we ought to be celebrating? We ought to celebrate it like we celebrate other monumental events in our history. because it allowed us to fulfill the American dream that we are all created equal, that we are all entitled to the rights given us as citizens born into this country. That's something extraordinary to celebrate. It's why Lyndon Johnson waited until July 2nd to sign the Civil Rights Bill into law, because he wanted it very close to the day we celebrated the anniversary of the creation of the United States of America. He realized it was that important. The Civil Rights Act of 64 stands next to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as the most important legislation ever passed by this nation. And St. Augustine was instrumental in its adoption. We should not forget that. We should never forget that. But where does St. Augustine fit in all of this? Well, it was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference movement that developed in the wake of the Montgomery bus boycott. And its first iteration was in Albany, Georgia. Albany was a complete disaster. It was a disaster for King. He got pulled into Albany, Georgia in large measure because SNCC was there, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The NAACP was there and everybody was wondering where is SCLC. Well, they got pulled in and they got outfoxed by a sheriff who simply arrested people, didn't hose them down, didn't beat them with sticks, didn't turn the dogs loose on them, just arrested them, put them in jail, kept them in jail until the movement was literally without soldiers. That, uh, uh, those developments in Albany, Georgia, led King to rethink, and, his, and the leaders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, to rethink what they were doing. And they went from there to Birmingham, Alabama, the second key campaign in the movement. The third key campaign was St. Augustine, Florida. And the fourth, of course, was Selma, Alabama, that led to the adoption of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So why did King choose St. Augustine? Of all of the options that lay in front of him in 1964, why St. Augustine? Why even conduct a, dem a series of demonstrations in 1964 when in the wake of the assassination of John Kennedy in November of 1963, it looked like the country would adopt a Civil Rights Act anyway? Well, King felt, and he felt strongly, as did those around him, that if they didn't get on the forefront of the movement, the same sort of thing would happen that happened in the 19th century. 
when the United States passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, African Americans had sacrificed during the Civil War and the post-Civil War period, but weren't on the front lines of that change. And then when the country moved to undermine the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, black citizens stood back. King didn't want that to happen again. He wanted black citizens to be on the forefront of change, and whatever change occurred, they would stand behind it for the rest of their lives and sacrifice their lives to ensure that that change remained. So that's why they wanted, they wanted demonstrations someplace. Well, why not Washington, D.C.? Why not bring the movement to Washington, D.C.? Well, King was anxious that they went to D.C., they shut down the government, or affected the course of government, that the allies in the movement in the Congress would turn against the movement and turn against the Civil Rights Act. So Dr. Haley and some of his close friends in St. Augustine approached Dr. King at a meeting on Orlando. They didn't get to see Dr. King, but they got to talk to the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker. And they asked Walker if he would consider coming to St. Augustine. And at first he was uncertain. He was worried about what he was reading about St. Augustine, that perhaps the community was becoming a little bit too violent, the movement in particular. And maybe St. maybe the Southern Christian Leadership Conference couldn't control it and ensure that the issues for which SCLC stood uh, were not carried forward. 